thanks for joining us. Glad you, that you could be a part of our Wednesday gathering. And if you've been tracking with us for a while on Wednesdays, you're aware that I've been stuck on this idea of looking at the sayings and teachings of Jesus. Yes, this is words to live by for, and, uh, but, but you can tell that I'm, I'm really passionate about this. And, and here's the reasoning behind it. Because as believers, what is our number one goal? What is our number one goal? Well, as believers, our number one goal is to be like Jesus, right? Well, that's where the term Christian comes from, Christ-like, to be like Jesus. Well, the followers of, of Jesus were in the, the New Testament attempting to do that. And I hope that today you and I are attempting to do that as well. Following Jesus' death and resurrection due to persecution, the believers that were in Jerusalem were scattered. And Christians ended up in various places such as Antioch in Syria. And, and, and so due to persecution... Believers were dispersed, and wherever they went, they shared the gospel, they shared the good news, they shared their story of their encounter with Jesus. And so uh, these believers in, in Antioch began to share their story and, and share the good news of Jesus, and revival just broke out in that area, not only among the Jews, but also among the Gentiles. And of course, you know, news of this got got back to the, the leaders in Jerusalem, and so they sent Barnabas to Antioch to check it out and to see what was going on. And of course, when, when Barnabas got to Antioch, he was excited because he saw that God was on the move and people were being saved and, and all of these new believers. And so he encouraged them, and he even brought Saul, who became the Apostle Paul, into the picture and partnered with them, and they were discipling these new believers. It was an exciting time. And in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, the scripture says, it was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. Now, Jesus didn't call his followers Christians, and these followers of Christ didn't call themselves Christians. Christians. The term Christian was given to them by the people of Antioch. So why did they call them Christians? Well, technically, the ending I-A-N in the word Christian means belonging to the party of. Kind of reminds me of going out to a restaurant. So you walk into the restaurant, you go up to the host, and you say, yeah, I'd like to put my name in. And they say, okay, what's your name? My name is Jim. How many in your party? I say, seven in my party. And they go, okay, great. Yeah, we'll, it'll be about 15 minutes, and we'll call you when we're ready. And so about 30 minutes later, they call you, Jim, party of seven. And everybody that's associated with my group stands up, walks to the table following the waiter or waitress, and we all sit down together and we, en we enjoy a meal. And so the term Christian meant those of Jesus' party. And so with this in mind, to be a believer, a follower of Jesus, a Christian, we must associate ourselves with the person and the teachings of Jesus. Well, it only stands to reason that if we are associating with the person and teachings of Jesus, we got to know what those teachings are. And that's why I feel so passionate about this topic of, of, of listening and hearing and observing and absorbing these words that Jesus spoke during his time here on earth. Because if we're going to refer to ourselves as, as Christians, the party of Jesus, we've got to have personal relationship with him, and we've got to know and embrace his Teachings. It stands to reason that if we really want to be like Jesus, we're going to have to have a personal relationship and we're going to have to know what he said and what he taught in order to follow him. So yes, we are in part four, words to live by, but 
uh, during this particular session, these three weeks that we have together, we're going to take a little bit different approach. So we're going to be looking at the words of Jesus through his prayer. So the words of Jesus as he prayed them. And so we're going to begin with a prayer that he prayed in the garden to fully understand how he submitted himself to the will of the Father. And so if you have your Bibles, of course, or your app, whatever you're using to read Scripture, of course it's going to be on the screen as well. We're going to be reading out of Matthew chapter 26, beginning at verse 36, and then we'll read down a ways. And so it goes like this. Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And he said, sit here while I go and pray. So he took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. And he told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And then he went a little further, bowed his face to the ground, praying. And so here are the words that Jesus is praying. These are the words that we want to really focus on. And he says this, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. And then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. And he said to Peter, couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation, for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. And then Jesus left them a second time and prayed. And here are his words in prayer. My father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. And when he returned to them again, he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open. So he went to pray a third time, saying the same things. What a powerful scene that is in the garden. Not only did Jesus pray, not my will, but your will be done, he prayed it three times. Numbers are really significant in the Bible. One of the most significant numbers is the number three. Three represents completeness. For example, the Godhead is complete in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus was crucified on the cross, put into the tomb, and remained there for how many days? Three days. And then he, he rose again. Jonah was thrown over the side of the boat and swallowed up by a great fish and spent three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. In the Old Testament, we have three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then here in this scene, there were three of the disciples that went a little bit further into the garden with Jesus, Peter, James, and John. And so Jesus exemplified complete surrender as he prayed three times, not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. So what does it mean to totally surrender to God? Well, it means not holding back any part of our life from God. It means setting aside our own will for the plan and purpose of God. It's a lifestyle of surrendering continually. How many of you know that surrendering to God is not a one-time deal, but it's, it, there is this continually surrendering to the Word of God and to the leading of the Holy Spirit in our lives? An assistant pastor, uh, Josh Blevins, says, Absolute surrender is not me getting closer to God, but it's God getting closer to me. If you truly trust God, you won't need to know all the facts about your future because you know that God has your best interest at heart. And boy, that's, 
that's a statement for me because, you know, a lot of times I want to know, I want to know the end before I start something. I want to know how's this going to turn out? How's everything going to go? What's, you know, what is this all about? I want to, I want to know all the facts. I want to know all the details. I want to know how this thing is going to go before I launch out. But sometimes with God, it's just not that way. <laughs> you know, God says, go. It kind of reminds me of Abram. You know, God called Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees and he said, pack up, buddy. You're going on a journey. Well, where are we going, God? Well, I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> You'll know when you get there. You know, and we don't like that sometimes, but that's, you know, that's surrender. Living in total surrender is living a, in, with perpetual peace, knowing that no matter what the circumstances are, God is in control. And how many of us need that right now? Even as the election returns are coming in, you know, we, it, we some of us are, are disturbed and upset and worried and fretting. And it's like, but, but when you are living in total surrender, you can have perpetual peace knowing that no matter what the circumstances, God is in control. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's up to. He knows what the end looks like and everything in between. And of course, this trust comes through an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Eckhart Tolle said, sometimes surrender means giving up trying to understand and becoming comfortable with not knowing. Perhaps some past experiences have kept you from living a life of complete surrender to God, and I hope that in our time together tonight that you'll move past that reluctance to a place of complete surrender. But what I want us to do is to spend a little bit of time together doing this. Let's look at five of the most common areas where we resist surrendering to God. So these are five things to let go and surrender to God. And the first is this. You've got to let go of your will. You've got to surrender your will to God. In other words, your control over the choices that you make. And this can become really difficult, especially if God is asking you to do something you don't want to do. It's hard to surrender to that. You, you know that you've truly surrendered when you obey quickly without reservation. And I'm thinking about Abraham and Isaac. When God called upon Abraham to go sacrifice his son Isaac, he didn't want to do that. But I love that, that passage of Scripture because it says, early the next morning, Without delay, without reluctance, without waiting around, without him hawing, he got up and he, he got everything that he needed for the journey that they would take to sacrifice his one and only son. That's surrender. That's surrender. Imagine if Jesus had done whatever he felt like doing and didn't listen to the Father's will. What would that look like? I'll tell you what, we would still be lost. We would still be without hope in this world, but... Jesus is our perfect example of a completely surrendered life. And when you think about how obedient Jesus was, you can't help but be grateful. You can't, you can't help but want to obey immediately as well. And when we look at this passage, this prayer that Jesus prayed in the garden, what exactly was he surrendering? Well, he was praying, Father, if you are willing, take this cup for me, yet not my will but your will be done. He was surrendering his will. And he's calling upon us to do the same. I find that when I choose to go my own way and do what I want to do, that's the time when I make the worst decisions. God will not force us to obey him. He'll wait patiently for us to finally see the errors of our way, which usually means, you know, going around the same mountain time and time again until we finally pass the test and choose to submit and surrender our will to God. Well, next, we, you need to surrender your time. Your time. How much time do you give to God? Imagine this. Imagine if we were able to tithe our time. That would that would be at least two and a half hours a day. We may not be able to do that, but it is something to think about. Some Christians, you know, they, they like to go throughout the day just kind of whenever time 
uh, permits whenever time is made available, maybe on their commute to work or, or maybe at downtime at work or maybe before going to bed, you know, now I lay me down to sleep or maybe a quick prayer over the meal. They like to, you know, to, to, to take that opportunity. Others like to make, make an appointment with God and just say, God, I'm going to set aside this, this block of time. And, you know, both are good, but we've got to be careful not to become religious about it, but most importantly, to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit when he's calling us to spend time with him. And I also think we have to be careful because sometimes we confuse uh, doing for God with being with God. See, sometimes we get so busy doing for God that we'll forget to spend time with God. And if you look at the story of Mary and Martha, what do you think Jesus would prefer? Would you, do, do you think he would prefer you doing things for him, or do you think he would prefer you being with him? So we've got to surrender our time. Have you ever gotten to a place where you felt like God was a million miles away? You know, it's just like, God, where are you? And here's what James tells us. If you find yourself in that situation where it seems like God is, is a million miles away, James says this. He says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And that all has to do with surrendering our time because sometimes God can feel so far away, but the way to bring him close and the way to be near to God is to, is to draw near to him, and then he will draw near to you. We also, you also need to surrender your money. And you might be thinking, here we go again, another preacher talking about money. And I hope it doesn't sound that way, but I want you to consider this. The two biggest tests to see where your treasure lies is how you spend your time and how you spend your money. Do you put God first with your money, with your finance? Or do you, you know, pay all the bills and spend money on what you want to spend it on and maybe a little bit in savings and then when all of that is taken care of then you know whatever's left over then i'm going to i'm going to give that to god well if that's you then this passage in in the book of haggai in the old testament might apply where the lord says you have planted much but harvested little you eat but never have enough you drink but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are, are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. Have you ever felt like that? It's like, it just seems like you can't get ahead. It seems like just about the time you're trying to get ahead, the water heater goes out, or, you know, you, you're trying to maybe save up a little money, and then the tires need replacing on the car, or, uh, you know, or something else goes out, and, and it's like, this seems like you could, you, you know, the, putting money in a purse with holes in it just never seems to be enough. Well, tithing is the only thing that God asks us to test him in, and I'm convinced that he's longing to bless you but he needs to know that he is your source. Not your finances, not your job, not the lottery ticket. He wants to bless you, but he needs to know that he's your source. And when you bring your tithe to the Lord, he will bless whatever you have left. I'll tell you what, I'd rather have 90% with the blessing of God on it than 100% without his blessing. He will bless you He'll open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing so big that you can't contain it. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm a, I'm a witness of that, that God, God will bless your faithfulness in, in giving. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, Jesus speaking, and we're looking at the words of Jesus. Jesus says, no man can serve two masters. Either he's going to hate one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. He says, you can't serve God and mammon. What, what does that word mammon mean? It means riches. It means wealth. It means money. It means possessions. You can't love God and love these things as well. Well, next, you need to surrender your relationships. And this might be hard for some people because, you know, if you're an extrovert and you're a very relational person, this could be really difficult. 
I remember being a teenager and surrendering my life to Christ. I didn't grow up in the church. I came to Christ as a, as a young teenager, and I had a lot of non-Christian friends. And on one hand, I wanted to lead these friends to Christ, but then on the other hand, I realized as a young Christian that these relationships were not a positive influence. And so I had to surrender those relationships to God. And that was difficult, especially being a teenager, because peer relationships are huge. And I remember praying and asking God, I, was say, I said, God, I, I pray, please, I need some good friends that will be a positive influence in my life. And God answered that prayer. He began to send friends that were a, a positive influence into my life. I had to surrender my relationships to Jesus. And God bless that. And I know he'll bless you in that area as well. You may have some unhealthy relationships that you need to surrender to God. Or maybe you found yourself in, a, in an abusive relationship. It, it can be difficult to unentangle yourself from that relationship. And here, this would be my advice for you is seek godly counsel and support. Seek godly counsel and support. Trust God to help you get free from that abusive relationship. I love what the psalmist said in Psalm 1. I think there's so much wisdom in this passage. He said, oh, the joys of those who do not follow evil men's advice. Where are you getting your input? Where are you getting your advice? Where are you, who are you being mentored by? Who's influencing your life? That's what the psalmist is saying here, and he says, don't hang around sinners scoffing at the things of God, but delight in doing everything God wants you to do. And day and night, meditate on his word and be thinking about ways to follow him more closely. What great advice there in terms of relationships. Seek godly input and influence in your life. And then finally, Surrender your rights. Man, this, uh, to, in, today, in today's culture, this is huge because it's all about my rights. So it's all about our rights. And yet Christ comes along and he says, surrender your rights. The rights that I'm referring to is the right to be offended or the right to always be right. You know, sometimes it's better just to say I'm sorry and move on because holding offense in your heart will fester and lead to bitterness. You've got to let it go. You've got to forgive the offense just like Christ has forgiven you. We're going to talk a, a lot more about this next week. But suffice to say, for now, you've... Sometimes we might even feel justified in trying to get back at the person or take revenge. And I'll tell you, this only leads to more bitterness and hate. I think an important passage for us to understand in this regard is the passage in Deuteronomy 32, 35. And this is the Lord speaking, and he says, Vengeance is mine and recompense. The word recompense means repayment. Sometimes we feel like, you know, Vengeance is mine. I've, you know, I've got uh, I've to I've take it out on, on whoever the offender is. But God is saying, hey, wait a minute. Just, just, just be still. Just, just back up a little bit. Vengeance is mine. I'll repay. You don't have to worry about it. I'll repay. And he goes on to say, their foot will slip in due time. For their day of calamity is at hand, and the things come to, to hasten upon them. In other words, God is saying, hey, you know what? There's a law of the harvest. You reap what you sow. You know, and, and th there's going to be some reaping that'll happen. Just let it go. You don't have to take care of it. In my position as pastoral care pastor and in working with people at Celebrate Recovery, I've seen people who have struggled with hurt and bitterness. And when they finally let go of it, they find peace in their lives. It might not be instant peace, but it's a process of continually and purposely refusing to hold on to resentment. When they learn to surrender those feelings to the Lord, 
They begin to gradually subside and they're free of all the bitterness and unforgiveness. And then the Lord brings healing and restores joy to their soul. I tell you what, that's, that's a beautiful thing to see when somebody is set free from bitterness and hurt and anger and resentment and starts to find the joy of the Lord in their life. It, it is a beautiful and powerful thing. But we've got to learn to surrender our rights if we're going to get there. Here's a passage from Pastor Rick Warren that describes the consequences of not surrendering to God. And I, I quote, if, if not God, you will surrender to the opinions or expectations of others, to money, to resentment, to fear, or to your own pride, lusts, or ego. You were designed to worship God. And if you fail to worship Him, you'll create other things. We call them idols to give your life to. But listen to this line. You are free to choose what you surrender to, but you are not free from the consequences of that choice. Let me read that again. You are free to choose what you surrender to, but you are not free from the consequences of that choice. Paul paints a picture of what a truly surrendered life looks like, and we're going to close with this passage in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. That's true surrender. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I love what Bill Johnson said. He said, faith doesn't come out of great effort, but out of great surrender. Faith doesn't come out of great effort. It comes out of great surrender. I hope this message helps you surrender all of those hidden areas of your heart, those areas you've been keeping from God. Whatever you surrender to God, you make that area of your life available for God to bless. I love what I love what the apostle Paul said. He said, "Whatever we surrender to God, whatever we submit to God, whatever we yield to God, he's going to keep it until the return of Christ." I mean, that's a powerful promise from the Lord. If we're willing to surrender it, he's willing to keep it until the coming of Christ. If you look at the flip side of that promise, then if we're not willing to commit it to him, he's not obligating himself to keep it. And I don't know about you, but I want to I surrender. I want to surrender. Choose to let go and let God be the Lord of every area of your life. And when you do, you're going to be wondering, why didn't I do that sooner? It really is the truth. Why didn't I do that sooner? Here at the Highlands, we're all about next steps. You know, we don't want to paint this picture of this, you know, this big, broad thing that you have to do, and sometimes we feel overwhelmed by that. We're all about next steps. And here's what I would ask you tonight. What is your next step? As we were going through these things that we need to surrender to God, what did God put his finger on in your life? What is it that you need to surrender? Any one of these things or maybe something else. Maybe the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now saying, you know what? You need to surrender this area of your life. And so I want to invite you to bow your head wherever you are. Just put everything aside. Some of you are, you, maybe you've got the election returns going over here. Go ahead and just mute that right now. and Put it on pause. Wait a minute. Or maybe you're doing something else there around the house. Just, just put it down for a sec. Right where you are, just, just pause. Just bow your head with me. Close your eyes. You might be alone or you might be with other family members. But let's just, every one of us, let's do that. Let's just put everything down for a moment. Let's get quiet. Let's bow our head, close our eyes. 
What is the Spirit of God speaking to you about surrendering? And would you become willing to do that? I'm not asking you to, you know, just to revamp your entire life, but just what is that one thing that God is dealing with you about right now that you just say, that you would just say either quietly in your own heart or maybe even out loud, just say, God, I surrender, and whatever it is, I surrender this to you right now. Would you do that? I surrender this to you right now. And while we're doing that, and while we're allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to, into our lives, there are some of you that have joined us, and you've never had the opportunity to surrender your life to Christ. And I want to give you that opportunity right now. And we're going to pray a prayer inviting Christ to come into our life. And I'm, if you've never prayed this prayer before, I want to invite you to pray this with us. Just say, God, I surrender my life to you. I know I've sinned. I know I have fallen short of your expectations for me and that the penalty for sin is death according to scripture. But tonight I'm not choosing death, I'm choosing to surrender my heart and my life to you. Would you forgive me of my sins? Thank you for what you did when you died on the cross, taking the punishment for my sin. Lord, I invite you to come into my life. Put your Holy Spirit within me so that I can continue to walk with you for the rest of my life. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.